beyond the reaches of our earth, amongst the eternal ether of the cosmos, last beings of true power and magnitude who lay beyond the comprehension of our minds, beings that shape and warp the fabric of space and distort the reality in which we live. To gaze upon their eyes is to gaze upon the eyes of infinity. To describe their figure is to describe the universe. To witness their power is to witness the power of the cosmos. I was but only a young man when I was first stricken with the devilish fever that had previously claimed my family. I was to be considered lucky, as the great plague of bloodletting did not bring about my end. It was only the insanity and fear of the cosmos that came with it that ailed me. And that insanity ails me to this very day. To my kin, the true fever and pain of the plague would be their end. My mother was the first to go. She'd slice her wrists in a fit of hysterical madness while my sister and I were away at school. It was my father who found her, falling to her body in a futile struggle that some divine interaction would bring them back together. As it turned out, that divine interaction would simply be the contact of my mother's tainted blood. On the night that my father expired, the swelling of blood his brain caused, what I had first believed to be delusions, visions of great cosmic and ethereal horrors, fearing their awesome power over the mind of man, he too took to the blade, ending his life face down in a pool of plagued blood. My sister was awoken by his fit of insanity, but before the light of her candle could illuminate the void of the room, her feet felt the blood, and she knew. I was the only one who could care for my sister, as we had no other family. Having turned fourteen the month prior, my sister was a small, frail child who could be frightened merely by the sight of her own shadow. She did not last as long as mother or father. Who fought the plague for nearly a week. My sister hardly had beyond the third day, and a part of me wishes I never witnessed the fourth. I shall refrain from describing how my sister passed, as the brutality and gore of the event left me in such fragile mind that I was admitted to the Providence Asylum of the Insane. It was here that I first began to experience the true nature of the universe and its unforgiving forces. As I mentioned, I was stricken with fits of madness and insanity, but not by the plague. If such were the case, I believe this manuscript would not be here to unleash the knowledge of horrors that it holds. It was during the first month of my admittance into the hospital that I had met an artist by the name of Joseph B. Wilcox. I never learned the reason that Joseph, too, was admitted to the hospital, only that he felt the need to be there to protect someone, be it himself or family. He was a tall, skinny fellow, a neatly cut head of brown hair and a pair of delicate blue eyes. His hands were soft and slender, like that of a woman's, a clear sign that he preferred the intellectual arts of painting and clay sculpting over the more physical and manual labors of other men of his age. We became quick friends, realizing that we were of the more stable bunch within the hospital. Joseph would tell stories of life in the small village outside of Providence, whose name escapes my thought, and would often gift me with small sketches to decorate the drab and numbing room in which I stayed. I would tell stories of working in the family shop behind the counter to help reach the jars of sweets that neither my mother or sister could reach, or of the kind old woman who often came to purchase candles and soaps, and how she would always find my youthful exuberance a charming quality I should not let go of so easily. It was the night 
of March 8th, when Joseph entered my room, his footsteps slow and monotonous as he crept to my bedside. I did not hear him enter. I only felt that he laid one of his feminine hands on my arm and shook me. When I woke to see him standing over me, I shot up, frightened by the scarred and blood-stained face that stood before me. In his madness, Joseph had crafted a shiv from his bed frame and carved queer sigils along his face and arms. His eyes were bloodshot and his mouth curled into a sinister smile. He placed the shiv on my lap and laid his hand on my shoulder, whispering some sort of terrible mantra into my ear. His hand drifted to the shiv and he beckoned me to join him in a paradise lost a millennium ago. Blood drained from my face and I felt my arms grow cold and I witnessed a wretched abyss manifest beyond him and what seemed like that which is beyond the normal world. A rush of hatred and anger overtook me as I plunged the shiv into his gut. The gargled and raspy voice of my once friend slowly fading as he fell limp on the molded and rotting floor. Fear overtook as I was too terrified to remove my eyes off the body before me. When I finally broke the trance and looked up, the asylum of which I was confined had warped and twisted into a vista of blackened skies and gray earth below me. Above the vast purgatory that I stood floated, a being that still haunts me in my thoughts and memories of it, and maddens me in my dreams of it, swirling, churning, gurgling, and writhing like a mass of blackened earth worms in a rotting corpse was the demon sultan, who so repugnantly controlled the skies and cosmos as one. I was amongst a land of predators, and I was not worthy enough to be thought of as prey. I felt as the frail mind of mine shattered, my eyes rotting from the sight of such an eldritch terror that no man would ever know. The wardens found Joseph's body in the shiv under my cot, and there was no fighting, but it was already apparent. The horrors I witness remained with me in life, and when my body shall soon convulse in the noose placed around my wretched throat by the hangman, so too shall the horrors assault me in death, for earth is not our home. Our earth is merely an asylum of the fragile-minded who are too weak to gaze upon the awesome terror and power of the universe.